people see it differently now than they used to. I'm 78. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that it was assumed that if you were diabetic, you would have a short and miserable life. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that my life is not miserable, but also I work out Mm -hmm. and I care about what I eat and what I feed people. Hi, I'm Linus Woods Mullins, and I love to help women to vibe, to be more vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered in midlife. So come on, let's vibe. I've always been inspired by people who kind of break the... um, stereotype of whatever it is, uh, because we already have so many preconceived ideas of what it is we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to be doing it, uh, all these ideas and standards and expectations of what's supposed to come at what stages in our lives. But the reality is that so much of it depends on the individual. And I think it first starts with the mindset and what it is you've decided that you that you want to do, regardless of the stage of life. Because after all, isn't that what Vibe Living is all about? It's about, you know, maintaining that vibrancy, that intuition, and that beauty and empowerment, regardless of what your life, what your age is, but in particular, uh, after 40. And today we have a guest with us who has definitely done that. I'm so excited to introduce to all of you Vibers out there, Lynn Bowman. Lynn is the author of an Amazon bestseller, Brownies for Breakfast. I just love that title. And it's been featured at women's expos throughout the country. And she um, also has been teaming with uh, with actor uh, Deidre Hall to write and publish Deidre Hall's Kitchen Close-Up. I'm so excited to have you here. She's been a creative director at EJ Gallo Winery, an advertising manager. She has actually had a fantastic career, and now she's in the business of helping others when it comes to dealing with some of the things that happen as we age. And it's so wonderful to have you here, Lynn, really. Deandra Hall, I I remember her. I remember watching her when I was in college. Um, It was the NBC soap opera, I can't think, Another World, is that, was that it? Days of Our Lives. Days of Our Lives. Okay, but she has been the sexy and wise Dr. Marlena Evans on Days of Our Lives since time began. I think it was 1975 or 76, because my first child was born in 75. And she she got this gig and, you know, was excited. But but we thought it was a couple of weeks or maybe, you know, a recur. And she's she's still doing it. It's a new thing because I, you know, I never watched soap operas, but I started watching them when I was in college because of how my class schedule was, and a so lot of, a lot of people, right? Like, yeah. And so it came on at a time when this is when I was going to school in Atlanta, and I would watch her, and I also watched another um, soap opera that um, my best friend ended up being a star in. But at that time, we were all in college. Yeah, her name was Bianca Ferguson, and she played Jeannie Francis's best friend in General Hospital. And uh, it was just weird. So those were the two that I would watch. And when you said Deidre Hall, I kind of stumbled over the words. Oh, Deidre. Yeah. She seems like such a nice person. And, and she's still at it. And we talk, you know, most days or every other day and can't get over the fact that we could not imagine. I mean, no way did we ever imagine that she would still be doing this work? Isn't that incredible. And at this age, uh, apropos to what you're talking about, yeah. you know, we, we assume, you know, and she was she was the pretty young blonde. So what kind of a future was there? In- <laughs> None. Well, it came along right at a time where uh, that was definitely uh, not the case. And that was definitely, she, she once again, broke the mode of the expectations that some of us might have when it comes to the way we look or what we do or how we grew up. And really the world is our oyster. It all depends on the mindset. And that brings me to you. What led you to write this book, Brownies for Breakfast, first of all, and why that title? Well, a a lot of things. Uh, For one thing, when you you write a book and you hope that people will see it and notice it and, and read it and buy it, you need a catchy title. Um, so that's a, a little bit why that's there, but 
what I wanted people to understand, it, it's written, as you know, the subtitle is a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. Um, and um, so many diabetics and the people who love them don't understand that you can eat like royalty. I mean, you can eat beautifully as long as you eat smart, you right. know, right. and whole and real food. And, and what I wanted to do is to make it simple. I've been diabetic since I was in my forties. I, like a lot of women, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And so they tell you at that time, and of course the medicine was so different in the seventies. I mean, it was a different world. Um, and, and they say, well, when you are in your forties or so, you are likely to develop this type two diabetes. And because my mother had died young, Linus, I was determined that I was not going to do, do that to my kids. If I didn't have to, I was going to still be standing. You know, I was going to be there for them if I possibly could. So I started researching way back when, uh, because the medical community was like, well, you're going to, you know, this is just the way it is. And you want to keep your weight down. And that, that was all they had for me. So, so I started doing the research and the thinking uh, on my own about what the best thing, the best path forward was. Right. Right. And um, so over the years, you know, exercise and this and that, and, and I was very conscious about food and, um, and I, I knew that I had to go, first of all, none of us had any money uh, back in the seventies or eighties. You know, we drove crummy old cars and had crummy little apartments and we didn't have any dough. So you had to cook. You, you had to learn how to make something out of what you had. And uh, so the combination of those things over the years, and then I had a bunch of kids. I had three kids. uh, I'm happy to say. And so, and a career full time and a single mom, no support, at all coming from anywhere except me. So I I learned how to combine healthy and fast and cheap. Right, right. Which you Great know so, anyone. <laughs> that's that's how we have to roll, you know, most of us. And um and I would have friends and the only way I could entertain would be to have friends, professional friends, whatever, come over to my house because I had a bunch of kids. So, so it would be around my table. And, and I had a lot of people saying, gee, this is really good. <laughs> this is really pretty good. How'd you do this? Well, you need to write about this because I was a writer, uh, a creative director and copywriter. And so I had people saying, you know, you should. Do it. So um, Deidre and I worked up a couple of projects and had fun doing that. And it also coincided with the the um, sort of dawn of self-publishing. Mm. So all of a sudden it was a new toy that we had and we could do this work publishing without going through all the yada yada of finding the agent and giving, although we kind of started down that path and then we said, you know what, let's just do this. Let's do it. Okay. So, you know, the way women do at our kitchen table. And, and she said to me, I'm going to Australia. You know, and I, and I said, of course, you need a book. We need to get this book done for you so that you can take it to Australia. And so the two of us, uh, six weeks later, I mean, we threw this thing together because I always, I had the recipes and I knew what I wanted to say. And she added stuff. And off we went to Australia with the book. And it was big fun. And people seemed to enjoy it. So we did a second one. Wow. And then. And then this newest book, uh, Brownies for Breakfast, has come about because I see how complicated people seem to want it to be. You know, you see folks on YouTube and um, doctors and so on talking about all the chemistry and the biology and all what the cells do and what your pancreas does. I think people want to know, what the heck do I eat? Right, right, right. right. How do I do this? How do I manage to have the food that I need to feed a family, to afford it? How does all that work? So um, that's the book. It's here's how you do it. You know, it's interesting because you're right. A lot of people, when they get diagnosed with diabetes, there's all kinds of ways their mind goes, all kinds of directions. But inevitably, it's going to be, okay, what can I eat? And, you know, how... 
Yeah, but inevitably. How did you go about learning this? I know that I don't think you're a nutritionist. So how did you go about learning what would work? Well, for it was the result of all these years of me finding out what worked for me mm -hmm. um, and researching everything that I possibly could out there and finding out that, frankly, and I love y'all nutritionists out there, but what they were learning in nutritionist school was not what the latest stuff was coming out that was really helpful and part of this is is you know youtube became a thing and and google became a thing and suddenly you had access right to all this from all over and another thing you you know this linus but mds did not have any training no, in nutrition at all. None, none at none. All. And yet there, that was where you went for your advice about your medical condition. Mm -hmm. And so I got the clue kind of early that the doctors were not going to help me. Um, it was some renegade. And actually what really kind of was the, the final formation for the book, um, I had it about half written and I had you know a lot of stuff in there in my recipes and it was all going really good. And then I saw that there was going to be a gathering of the plantricians in Oakland, California, which is close to where I am. And so uh, something, you know, how you'll just have a little voice on your shoulder saying, you need to do this. You really need to do this. And I said, wait, spend all that money and go to that conference with all those talk. Yes, you need to do this. <laughs> OK, so I did. And it was a five day conference and it was PowerPoints, not my favorite thing from eight in the morning until eight o'clock at night. And these were a thousand MDs from all over the world who were mavericks, who were, um, you know, not going along the main main path there, who believed in healing with food. Imagine that. <laughs> and that. So suddenly here I was with a thousand of these educated, brilliant, wonderful voices in the room with me talking about, and so I learned an enormous, in that five days, I learned an enormous amount about the state of the art medically. Where are we? What is the, all of the very latest research saying? What is it? So that's in the book. Not, I mean, what what's in the book is the conclusions that these MDs had come to, um, which I still stand by. You know, there's always... Again, if you're looking on YouTube, you'll always be seeing guys say, no, that's wrong. You know, you need, you need to eat nothing but pig fat and that'll fix it. You know, and OK, right. And oh, nothing but bananas. And that's right, your right. ultimate. Exactly. You're all over the place. You're absolutely right. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, when someone, like I said, is diagnosed with that, you can be just reeling in terms of what do I even knowing the questions to ask. But. If someone's been recently diagnosed with uh, diabetes, whether it is type two or God forbid type one, what are some of the questions they need to be asking their doctors? Well, um, are you qualified to tell me what to eat? How about that one? <laughs> I think um, it's a great one. Absolutely. And if not, who can help me? Because what are some of the myths uh, in association to diabetes. When people are diagnosed, they have all these preconceived ideas of what it is and what it isn't. What are some of the myths? Well, there there are many. One of them is that you don't eat carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, another one is um, that it's because you ate sugar. Um, and let me explain both of those. Um, yes, you can eat, carb and you should eat carbohydrates, but only whole real carbohydrates, no processed. Because virtually, and, and I'm, I know I'm going to be like, yes, no. And, but to me, it helps if you're going to reset the way you think about your food to just go, okay, you know what? I'm not having any of that. I'm right. not going to do that. And I am going to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing I've always said to people is if, if you want to just pick one thing to do right now and it will make you more beautiful, more fun, you know, everything. It will improve your health. It will improve your life. Drop sugar. Do not eat any more cane processed sugar. And don't eat anything that's kind of like cane mm -hmm. processed sugar. 
So no maple syrup, no honey, no anything that is all sugar, don't eat it. And then they say, fruit, that's not all sugar. A fruit is a whole food that's full of fiber and all kinds of nutrition. It's real food. So what you're doing is just retraining your brain to go, okay, is it real? Right, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is that whole? You know, it's and there's so much in labels. People really should read labels. You know that old Free ad, label. Read label that old ad is you can't produce, you can't pronounce it. More than likely, it doesn't belong there. But you yeah. know, now they have apps that will read the labels for you and tell you, you know, is this dangerous to your health? I mean, it's amazing. I, I have one of the apps, and it's just amazing the information that's out there. And you know, I think that you know, information is power, but acting on the information is powerful. Where did you get the motivation to actually eat the things that you know you should be eating and to let go of the things that you know you shouldn't let go, that you needed to let go of? It's in my book. It's better. I promise you, my brownies are the best brownies you've ever eaten. Mm. They're fantastic. You will not. I mean, there's, I don't, I love food and I love to eat and I love to entertain. So, so all the, the recipes are delicious. <laughs> you know, you're not being deprived of anything. What you're doing is you're no longer eating crap. Right, exactly. You're no longer necessarily participating in the sad diet, you know, the standard American diet, which is, is pretty sad. Now, what about uh, diabetes and weight gain? What is, is there a direct, a direct correlation? Because I know some people think that yes. if you're diabetic, yeah. then you're going to gain weight or you already have gained weight. And there's still a lot of research going on about the exact chemical um, mechanisms that are the weight gain and why and so on. But essentially, it is true that with every pound you lose, your numbers get better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is a direct relationship between how much fat is in your liver and in your pancreas mm -hmm. and what your blood glucose numbers are, what your what your which is something that a lot of people don't think about, but it's very important to find out about the fat in your liver and pancreas because it definitely does make a difference in terms of how it functions in the digestive process. Because if, if that's out of whack, then you're just, it's going and to be- And how that fat gets into your liver and your pancreas mm. is through what you're eating. Mm. Absolutely. Sorry. Uh, but, it, but a thing I also- really like to point out to people is that your saliva actually will change. When you change the way you eat, when you stop eating sugar, when you stop eating processed meats, preserved meats, you know, the and it's all in the book, it's right there spelled out. Um, when you change the way you eat, your saliva changes. Mm. And it's so interesting that I can go back to foods that I used to just love and they just don't taste good anymore. Taste anymore. Isn't that interesting how our taste buds change, especially when we know what we're eating may not be uh, the best for you. Now, you've been a diabetic for a long time. Um, what kind of advice can you give someone that's just beginning this journey? Maybe they've just been recently diagnosed. What kind of advice do you have for them? Well, be grateful. Because if you do now what you should be doing, and here's what I like to do in this too. People, people see it differently now than they used to. I'm 78. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that it was assumed that if you were diabetic, you would have a short and miserable life. Right? Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that my life is not miserable. But also, I work out. Mm -hmm. And I care about what I eat and what I feed people. And um, and it's a privilege to be able to take time to work out. But I do that specifically because I think that when I take responsibility for my own health, I'm helping everyone around me. I, I don't want anyone else to have to suffer yes. because I didn't eat properly, didn't take care of myself. Um, and... And let me do this too. Um, I think it's okay <laughs> at this age to spend time in the gym. Absolutely. Right? 
Strength training is a number one on my list in terms yes. of taking better care. A lot of people don't realize that with strength training, you can, it actually burns fat, burns calories, even in your sleep when you're doing And weight. that's exactly what I was going to mention. Weight training, strength training, especially at this age, is huge. And there's also the social element. I've got a great bunch of girlfriends, you know, that I see at the gym. I, so I live in the country and it's a local gym. It's only four miles away. Mm -hmm. But the, and the money that we spend there is money we will not spend on prescription medicine or oh, um, yes. the doctor's office. You know, the other interesting thing is that some people think that if you have to eat healthy, that means you have to spend a lot more money. And I always tell them that you either pay for it on the front end or the back end. But guaranteed right. you're going to pay for it somewhere. The back end could be you in a beautiful casket with a great outfit on dead. Okay. Yeah. Or the front end could be hiring the team of people, so to speak, that are going to help keep you healthy, your nutritionist, your holistic doctor, maybe yeah. your massage therapist, your trainer, whatever it takes in order for you to be healthy. You look amazing at 77. And for those of you who are listening to her voice, her voice is, is, is vital, but her looks are amazing. I'm trying to think of who it is you remind me of, but it will come to me uh, later. It's and, and you have Helen Mirren colored hair, but that's not it. It's, it's someone, but I just can't think of who it is right now. But you know, now at this age, um, 77, 78, um, what are your plans moving forward? What kinds of things are you looking forward to doing? Well, I plan to keep making trouble as long as I can, <laughs> of course. Um, and I have a lot more writing to do. But the thing that happens to you when you become a grandparent is suddenly you have these other young people that are huge in your life and you want to, I, I think I told you, she, she did my makeup for, mm -hmm. for yeah, um, beautiful too. Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I'm, this is my Taylor Swift lip. I have <laughs> lips. And um, I have two grandkids right now and expecting another one. And that completely changes your life in a wonderful way uh, for many of us. And if you don't have grandkids, go find one, you know, um, <laughs> Having young people in our lives is so important. Having having a multi-generational life, I think, is hugely important. I have a couple of 20-year-old girlfriends that I love and who bring me the world, you know, yes. the new world. I just do. I'm very young. I, well, I have girl, my, my daughters are my best friends. They're in their 30s. And then I'm friends with their friends. But I find because of the kind of work that I do, which is, you know, a lot of, of, of technical stuff involved and being online and all that kind of stuff, that in order to stay current, you know, I find myself being attracted to younger people, which kind of gives you that vibrancy. And, you know, I, it's interesting because I hear baby boomers poo-poo all the time about millennials, Gen Xers, and so on and so forth. But in reality, I think it's kind of the other way around. Uh, we have a tendency not to want to give up that territory of being in control that we thought we were and turning it over. Whereas I have found refreshingly that the millennials and Generation X and everything else, they want to be, uh, you know, to learn from us. They want to hear our thoughts. They want the wisdom. They understand the importance of that. And I just think that we could just, you know, it's the same thing as what it was going on 34 years ago in terms of the generation gap and, you know, this thing between the, the generations butting heads. But you can change all of that. But I did want to ask you about your book. I know it's called Brownies for Breakfast, but you have a tagline here that says, um, and for all the people who love them, uh, what does that mean to you? Why did you include it's that? Two things. One, if you eat like I tell you to, listen to Granny here, if you eat the way I describe in the book, the way it, it also happens to be the very best diet for heart disease, to prevent heart disease, to prevent cancer. Now there's more and more research coming out. So if you um, are someone who loves a diabetic, uh, eat like a diabetic should be eating and you will be much healthier than you are now. So that's one. And two, if you have someone in the family who is struggling, for example, my son-in-law is celiac, so cannot eat gluten, can't eat gluten. Well, it's very helpful if the whole family eats gluten free. Right, exactly. This makes it easier. Yeah, absolutely. It's and it's just so much. It's kinder. It's easier, and you're going to discover all kinds of great new food. 
there's no problem. And then if you really are desperate to have something with gluten in it, go out and have some. But um, that's an example of what I'm talking about. If you have a diabetic in the family, please don't go out and buy a dozen donuts from, um, you know, is- <laughs> make yourself the donuts that are in the book. You want to be part of the solution, everybody. not part of the problem, because that's how awfully hard to to deal with that when someone is just definitely not on board and still eating the same way and you're not able to partake. You know, yeah. when I take a look at uh, Brownies for Breakfast, because I did go on Amazon and I, I got it. And Thank I, you. I, you're welcome. And I loved it. And I'm just wondering what makes your um, cookbook, in, in your opinion, different than some of the other cookbooks that talk about this very same thing? Okay, one, simplicity. Um, it's because... I have been on the front lines with a bunch of little kids having to cook, having to put dinner on the table. You know, it's not written from the point of view of a professional chef or a restaurateur or a person who has a TV show. It's written from my kitchen, from the front lines. That's one. Two, I took every photograph myself, except for the pictures that are of me. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted you to see, so no stylist was harmed in the making of this book. (laughs) I wanted you to to be able to make something that looked just like it looks in the book. Right, exactly, exactly. And and it's 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 simple food. It's it tells you how to take just ordinary simple things and elevate them really quickly, just with a little that and a little this. Um, It's doable. I promise you. Everything in the book is easy, is repeatable, is doable. You can riff on it. You can add stuff. You can take stuff away. But it gives you the basis of how to cook for everyone at your table. And let's talk a second about table. Mm. I want you eating at a table. I don't want you eating out of a bag in the back of your car. And I don't want your kids eating out of a bag in the back of your car. And I know... I know all the lessons and the ball teams and everything, but do we really want to give up our health and our culture for basketball practice? <laughs> exactly. Get your priorities straight. You know, this past weekend, I was with two of my grandchildren. I have six. I'm with two, two of them. Oh, lucky you. Yeah, we made brownies for breakfast <laughs> and it was amazing. It was so much fun. My eight-year-old granddaughter had so much fun putting it all together and her mom was out of town. That's why I was over there and, you know, we're, we're, she's checking in. And she says, what do you brownies for, for breakfast? And the first thing my daughter thought, because she was raised in the mid eighties, was like, okay, like, is that like you f- figured out that it was okay? Like they did on the Cosby show, you know, <laughs> because on the Cosby show, when they were making um, uh, chocolate cake, and chocolate cake did have eggs and butter and you know, sugar and all this stuff, the so-called good stuff. But I was telling you, I said, no, what's in here really is good stuff. And you know, it, the good thing about that, though, is that your book gives families an opportunity to educate themselves and then to use that education in a practical way by actually preparing the foods. And it's so easy to re- uh, read and so well done. And for those of you who are listening, all you have to do is go to the um, show description page there and you'll see all of her links and in particular the link to her book i highly suggest you get it is definitely worth it i'm getting ready to make some more stuff i'm trying to figure out what i'm going to do next i am not a big cook i have all kinds of cookbooks but i very rarely use them but i'm you using you have time yeah I'm using yours because my husband and I were just talking earlier this morning. When's a good day for us to cook everything we want for the week? And so we decided we're going to do that on Sunday. So I've got your cookbook. I have my shopping list. And on Sunday, we're going to have something from your cookbook. (laughs) Sunday ends up being the good day for a lot of us to do. I just had a, a, I call it my aerobic cooking because it's stress cooking. You know, (laughs) sometimes that's the way I work stuff out. But if you'll if you'll try the genius soup, Linus, genius, it's a soup. genius soup gets you through the whole week. It's like you make that batch of soup out of all the kind of sorry looking veggies in the bottom of your crisper, the ones that are, you know maybe yeah. uh, throw them in the soup, make a lovely pot of genius soup, and then you can do something different with it every night. 
um, or freeze some or whatever. So it's okay. I'm going to look up that recipe. We're going to definitely do genius soup. And Lynn, I think that you are a genius in terms of finding ways to speak into people's lives and to help save lives just by having fun eating healthy. So thank you so much for being on the Vibe Living Podcast. It's been wonderful having you here today. Thank you so much, Linus. You're welcome. And thanks to all of you listening. I know you could be listening to all the literally like 50 million podcasts that are out there. Thank you for making the Vibe Living Podcast the top 10% of Apple Podcasts. Keep listening. Please like, share, and subscribe. Let people know about this. We love talking about topics that are going to help you to be well and especially to help you to vibe, to be more vibrant, intuitive, beautiful, and empowered in midlife. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic day. And don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Vibe Living Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment and share this podcast. Have a fantastic day and don't forget to vibe. Bye-bye, everybody.